Welcome back. Now we will look into the individual tasks that this EICM model is going to perform. So now what is the first task that this EICM model is going to carry out, right? The task one is to record the user supplied resilient modulus because we, we said that we are going to supply an MR optimum value for a known water content and the uh, model is going to compute for all other uh, water contents. So it will record the user supplied resilient modulus of all unbound layer materials at an initial or reference condition. So that is this particular condition, right? It generally, it will be at or near optimum water, co water content and maximum dry density, right? So we, we know that we get the maximum dry density at their optimum moisture content. So this will be the water content for which we will compute the resilient modulus value and then specify it at, as a reference condition. Task 2 is evaluate the expected changes in moisture content from an initial or reference condition as the subgrade and unbound materials reach equilibrium moisture content. So uh, once we give the value of uh, the optimum moisture content depending upon the uh, variations in environmental conditions, it is going to calculate the changes in moisture content for the uh, subgrade and other unbound layers as a function of this initial. So with respect to my initial condition, how much is the variation? That is what we defined as S minus S optimum. Say for example, it is a degree of saturation or W minus W optimum. This is at any given condition. Right, so this will be computed. It also evaluates seasonal changes in moisture content. So this is an input value that we are giving. Based on this input value, the climatic models we have discussed previously, it is going to, so here the CMS model will in fact be used and uh, CMS model and the uh, precipitation since we have moisture content and the infiltration drainage model will be used here. Now, it evaluates the third task. So once we have the uh, reference condition and the changes in moisture content, the third task is to evaluate the effect of changes in soil moisture content with respect to the reference condition or the user entered resilient modulus, right? So uh, what are the changes in soil moisture content with respect to the reference condition? In the previous case, we have evaluated only the changes in moisture content, right? So here, the soil moisture content is calculated accordingly and the effect on resilient modulus is calculated. The fourth task is to evaluate the effect of freezing on the layer resilient modulus. So, so far we have been calculating the soil moisture content. Now we are going to see uh, quantify also the effects of freezing condition. So, as the temperature in the layer varies, how much is the freeze and thaw that is observed in the uh, pavement or observed in the granular layer to be precise. It also evaluates the effect of thawing. So this is the freezing part separately, which is task four. And task five is the thawing and recovery. Uh, in one of the slides in the previous lecture, I had shown that during freezing and thawing, how much is the variation in the strain, right? So immediately uh, when the soil is frozen, the modulus increases and therefore we saw the strain to reduce. And during the thawing period, there is a substantial reduction in the uh, modulus value and therefore we can see the strain to be higher. We had seen that in one of the previous lectures. So similarly, it is going to evaluate the effect of thawing and recovery from the frozen resilient modulus condition. Task 6 is to utilize time varying re resilient modulus in computation of critical pavement response parameters and damage at various points within the pavement system. So this, so far we have been working on the granular layers, right? So it is going to compute the variation of resilient modulus with time and quantify its effect on the uh, response parameters, right? And finally, it is going to evaluate change in temperature as a function of time for all asphalt layers. So up to task 6 is for granular and subgrade layer, right? And finally, for the uh, bituminous layers, we are only going to compute the effect of uh, temperature variation along the depth. Right? So, as we said earlier, a finite element method is adopted to compute climate dependent variation in 
material properties. So if we have to put it in a nutshell, simplify the process, these are the different tasks, these seven tasks are the, uh, are the simplified tasks that EICM is going to perform. Now, what are the inputs for the EICM model? So to perform all these tasks, what are the individual inputs that we have to give? One is the structural file which contains information about the cross-section of the pavement. What are the individual layers, thickness, material, uh, material properties and all other information required for different type of layers. The temperature data file, how air temperature varies, wind or sunshine data, sunrise or sunset and radiation data the lower boundary condition uh, section file which is for the uh, which is for the water table infiltration and drainage file and rainfall data these are the individual inputs which are required by the eicm model so there are about 800 weather stations in us uh, if you look into the uh, incorporation of this EICM model into the design procedure, we were talking about the requirements of these many input parameters and these many tasks that are that this EICM is going to carry out. So to carry out the tasks, we have to give all the appropriate material properties. So in US, they have about 800 weather stations for which this climate data is already available. They have collected the weather information for all the 800 stations with a minimum of 60 to 66 months of data, right? So at least for five years, they have data at every one hour interval over this five years, okay? So this information is already available in the uh, design software that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is used to implement the MEPDG, which is nothing but the AstroWare software. So this climate information is already available. In the next lecture, I will show you how it is done. Then. Um, uh, for, uh, for implementation of EICM, we need at least 24 months of hourly data. So this is, this is something which is a minimum requirement to, to, in, uh, to use this EICM model, right? Now let us see what are the input parameters that is required by this in detail for each of, each of the uh, different functions, right? So these are the input parameters for model initialization and climate or boundary condition. So we said we are going to specify a boundary condition. We have an upper boundary condition, we have a lower boundary condition, right? So what are the boundary conditions? Again, if you look at MEPDG, they have a concept called level 1, level 2, level 3 data, right? So what are these level 1, level 2 and level 3 data? Level 1 is the most precise data with as minimum approximations as possible. So if I, if I am giving a level 1 data, uh, let us say, um, the uh, let us say we are uh, we are trying to input the climate data. So all the parameters will remain constant, the required parameters will remain constant across level 1, level 2, level 3 but with what precision am I collecting these input parameters? That is the variable. So level 1 has the most accurate data or uh, with a data with minimum approximations, most of it calculated in the laboratory or direct measurements carried out, right? So that is a level 1 data. But you should remember that this level 1 data is collection of level 1 data is highly laborious, time consuming and so on. But that is a precise data that we have. Next we move on to level 2 data. Level 2 data is partly data collected from field or partly the actual data and partly the data which is calculated uh, from other constants or using some available models, right? So that is the uh, level 2 and level 3 is the most uh, uh, most approximate data either we would take it from the uh, take it from the history information or take it from a nearby location or uh, calculate one or two parameters measure one or two parameters and use equations to compute all the remaining parameters that is a level 3 data so they give a provision for the user to input any of these three uh, levels of data we have to choose whether we want we are uh, inputting a level 1 level 2 or level 3 right and for uh, most of the level 3 data the default values which are available with the astrover will be used right but we should note here that these default values are calibrated or calculated for a set of conditions which which may not be exactly similar to our uh, location of interest right so that is a caution that we have to exercise when we are using level 3 data <coughs> right now let us look into the parameters and the description of each of these parameters. So we have the base or subgrade construction and completion date uh, which is just to use the uh, to, uh, to, to 
make a note of the time period time uh, period that we are interested in the design period the years for which we want to design the pavement for the latitude longitude and elevation ground water table depth and layer thickness so these input parameters are required for initialization of model just to say when time is equal to zero and for controlling the length of analysis so what is my t max the maximum time for which i am uh, interested in computing all the parameters then the latitude longitude or elevation are required to uh, define the climatic conditions so we said that the solar radiation and many parameters can be approximated using latitude so we need this information also third one is groundwater table depth this groundwater table depth is an input parameter which is needed as a boundary condition so we said the suction capacity is solely dependent on water table depth so we need this input parameter also and then layer thickness to identify the system profile right so to compute uh, thickness of individual layer perform sub layering and all other tasks now what are the input parameters we will ignore pcc for now what are the input parameters required for hot mix asphalt concrete material properties so we need thermal conductivity heat capacity and surface short wave absorptivity so what are these parameters thermal conductivity is nothing but given a thickness i have a temperature t at this point what is the rate at which this temperature t will be conducted throughout this system right that is nothing but the thermal conductivity similarly heat capacity so once i supply a heat how much i am able to withstand the heat how much i am able to hold on to that heat and for how long i am able to hold on to that heat that is nothing but heat capacity and surface short wave absorptivity is we said we have solar radiations which is falling on the pavement right so given a certain intensity of solar radiation falling on the pavement how much this pavement is able to absorb the solar radiation if it is we know that pavement has a black surface so it is able to absorb more amount of radiations compared to any other surface right so these are the three parameters required for bituminous layer so direct measurements are recommended for this at level 1 you can see here but default properties are also available for user convenience so we can use any of these two methods to obtain this value for level 2 the same properties direct measurements or default values level 3 you can see they have directly uh, said that we can use default values available so this is for the hot mix asphalt next what are the uh, input parameters required for compacted material property we have another table wherein the input parameters required for in situ uh, condition is also given so this is for compacted material property so we want the specific gravity right this is for a granular layer and we want the saturated hydraulic conductivity so what is the conductivity of the soil how much water it is able to transmit under saturated conditions similarly maximum dry unit weight we know that dry thermal conductivity how much what is the thermal conductivity of the soil when it is in a dry condition right and what is the dry heat capacity so again in a dry condition if a heat uh, is supplied to this particular soil how much heat it is able to withstand and how long it is able to withstand that heat we know plasticity index and these are some properties with regard to the gradation percentage passing uh, 200 sieve number 4 sieve and d60 again we had seen all this in a previous lecture then we want optimum gravimetric water content this was also defined and the soil water characteristics curve so we also have sufficient introduction to swcc now what are the options for determination we see that it is a level 1 type of data so direct measurements are required for all these cases for thermal conductivity direct measurement is re recommended but if we do not have values we can also use the default values or take it from any other literature similarly for heat capacity for all for all other cases direct measurement is recommended next we move on to the uh, level 2 of data you can see whether it is level 1 level 2 or level 3 the input parameters are require are the same right we saw a similar set of parameters for level 1 also right but the uh, the, uh, the source from which we collect this information is going to be different even for level 2 direct measurement is recommended for all these parameters for these two it can be uh, default values can be combined and used again direct measurement for all these cases 
previously when we are talking about granular material its characteristics we said we need three input parameters one is the specific gravity second one is uh, second one is the water content present and third one is the dry unit weight. So, once we know these three things all other parameters can be computed and to compute the soil water characteristics curve we need additional parameters which is D60 percentage passing 200 uh, sieve and the plasticity index of the soil right. So, uh, these are the input parameters which have to be measured depending upon the irrespective of the level of uh, data. Then if we take level 3 alone even the specific gravity is not required to be calculated. So, you can see even this is taken from a history data or uh, calculated using equations. So, there is a lot of approximation involved here, right? But it is very convenient to be used when we do not have any data available with this. So, it caters to different uh, kind of users, people who have all the data collected and for cases where very limited data is available. So, both kind of users will be able to use this particular design procedure. Then we move on to the in, sit, uh, in situ natural and in situ material properties that are required to be input for level 1, level 2 and level 3. For all the 3 levels these are the data. So, if it is in situ we do not need specific gravity, we do not need to measure conductivity, these are all not required this can be measured or default value can be used, but for these things alone it is required because we say that uh, in in situ condition the material properties are measured uh, at the water content which is present in the soil. Hence, there is no need for additional computation and that is why we do not need all these parameters. Even the optimum, optimum gravimetric water content is not required for this case, right. So, these are uh, some of the inputs which are used in the EICM model and we will see what are the major outputs, right. So, the unbound resilient model is which is uh, which is uh, which is adjusted for the climatic condition. So, unbound MR adjustment factor, right, the adjustment factor that we have to use as a function of position, the location in the pavement system and the time value for every instant of time is computed for every sub layer. Okay. So, this is the first major output, we have the resilient modulus which is computed for each that is depth in terms of sub layer, the time variation, different time and as a function of position in the pavement. Then the temperature at the surface and at the midpoint of each asphalt bound sub layer. So, we said right for each, uh, so this is my layer. Let us say I am dividing it into two sub layer 1, I will call it a sub layer 1, I will call it a sub layer 2, right. For each sub layer, we will be, so uh, there will be temperature variation throughout the depth. Let us say that this is my temperature, it will be maximum here and it will reduce something like this, right. This is how the temperature will vary. But we are approximating it to a mid value because uh, then it will become a, a highly iterative process, we will have n number of layers, it is difficult to execute. So, we will assume the midpoint and then average the value for a given sub layer instead of doing it for the whole layer. Then for this sub layer point, we said we will have a temperature distribution, right. So, we will divide this into 5 quintiles and for each quintile we will compute the damage separately. Right. So, this is how it is executed. So, temperature at the surface and at the midpoint of each asphalt bound sub layer. So, these values are subject to statistical characterization. So, this is what we are saying as statistical characterization for every analysis period. The analysis period could be one month or a two week period. Okay. So, this is the second output that we will be getting from the EICM model. Then the mean standard deviation and quintile points are sent forward for use in the fatigue and permanent deformation model. So, we have uh, distress prediction models, we will talk about that subsequently. So, in the distress prediction models, we will be using the uh, temperature information also. This is one of the inputs that is required in the model. So, this information from uh, the sub layering and the quintile at every given instance of time will be translated to the distress prediction model. Right. Then we will also get values of Harley temperature at the surface and at a given uh, set of depth increment. Usually it is for every inch within the bound layers for use in thermal cracking model. 
So we also we also have a thermal cracking model which we will use for distress prediction. So in the thermal for the thermal cracking model, we need the variation of uh, temperature in the bituminous layers, which is at the surface and at every depth. So how small is the depth interval here? As small as one inch, right? For uh, the thermal uh, cracking model. So when we are talking about thermal cracking model, we will come back and uh, refer to this temperature output. Then we will also compute the volumetric moisture content. This volumetric moisture content is an average value for each sublayer, right? So, like how we take the midpoint for uh, midpoint value for temperature, here for the granular layer, we take the average value. So, if it is a sublayer, we compute the value over this entire thickness, we take the average value and then we use it, okay? So, that is used in the permanent deformation model for the granular layers. Then the external EACM outputs, right? All the other outputs are fed directly into the material characterization, structural response computation, and performance prediction mod modules. Okay, so these uh, information that are collected from here are input into the appropriate models, and then it is used for material characterization, it is used for structural response computation, and it is used for performance prediction, right? So, this, so this uh, calculation from the EACM model serves as an input for at different stages in the pavement design process for the computation of strain, for the computation of damage also. And uh, what are the some what are some of the uh, salient observations that we have seen from this model mm, there are there are some observations that that uh, people have reported from the analysis of eicm data we see that air temperature is the most influence, influential parameter regarding the pavement temperature this we had seen in the previous lecture with, with an uh, illustration also, right? So, we saw that among multiple parameters, there was a greater degree of correlation between air temperature and pavement temperature, but the, 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 the value of the degree of this correlation depended upon other parameters, right? Also, the difference between air temperature and pavement temperature varies from minus 12 to minus 9 degree Celsius and 4 to 10 degree Celsius. Again, these numbers are, are uh, calculated for climatic conditions in US. Uh, for India, in the, in the previous lecture, I was talking to you about the regression equation that, uh, uh, that we developed to compute the pavement temperature. So, when that equation was used, we, we observed that when the air temperature was about uh, 17 to 18 degrees, the pavement temperature was about uh, 35 to 40 degrees approximately. Right? But so this is about let me say this is 20 degree, let me call this as 40 degree. Whereas when the air temperature increased to 45 degrees, the pavement temperature increased up to 70 degrees. Okay. So the difference between air temperature and pavement temperature increased as the air temperature increased. So that was one observation that we were able to obtain from the air temperature pavement temperature correlation. So, the relationship between air temperature and pavement temperature is kind of linear as long as sunshine and solar radiation remain the same. So, this is uh, this is this uh, sunshine and solar radiation will remain the same or closer for locations lying on a given latitude. So, that is why we use latitude as one parameter to account for these two effects in the uh, pavement temperature model. So, this is with regard to the relation and also for an increase in solar radiation from 3000 to 4000 uh, British thermal unit per square feet per day, there is about 5 to 6 degree increase in pavement temperature. So, the influence of solar radiation and the uh, degree to which it correlates to air temperature, uh, we had seen in the previous lecture through, uh, through data from field and through uh, models. And similarly, for an increase in percentage sunshine from 45 to 90 percentage, there is about 5 to 6 degrees increase in pavement temperature. Also, the minimum pavement surface temperature can be considered to be very close to minimum air temperature. Um, in, in a few other models also, we have seen that when air temperature is 0, right? When the air temperature is 0, the pavement temperature will also be close to 0. As air temperature increases, right, let us say air temperature becomes 20, 
pavement temperature will be 35 or so. When air temperature, this is air temperature, pavement temperature. Now, when air temperature increases to, this is 20, when air temperature increases to 45, pavement temperature will increase to 70. Again, approximate, right? So, this uh, air temperature and pavement temperature will be closer when the temperature is close to 0 and as the air temperature increases, the difference expands, right? So, uh, since the uh, daily maximum temperature in a given year will be very high for, uh, for uh, Indian conditions compared to many other locations in US, it is very important that we predict the pavement temperature or we establish this uh, um, air temperature pavement temperature model very precisely. Next, uh, in, in, a, in, a very, in a very brief note, we will look into the validation of EACM. Uh, a lot of attempts have been made to validate the EACM model. If you look into this EACM model, it has lot of equations. We all ca we call them as models and we said we have infiltration, penetration, uh, precipitation, climate, material structures, etc. Each of these models use a number of equations, a number of variables, constants. So, it is important that we calculate these values correctly and verify their values time and again. Right? So, uh, depending upon the location for which it is used, the framework remains the same, but depending upon the location for which it is used, people have tried to re-evaluate the calibration constants. In fact, the EACM model itself suggests that it is, ca it is calibrated and validated for a set of data. They have tried to cover as much as uh, locations in US possible to calculate the constants, but still if, if the mo model is to be borrowed for another location which does not fall within this sample set for which it was calibrated, then it is required that we re-evaluate the calibration constants, right. So, uh, uh, studies have attempted to do that. So, here I will show you one illustration of how valid this EICM model is, is in predicting the material properties. Again, uh, for the sake of brevity, I have just shown here the illustrations for granular materials, but you can see there are a lot of studies available which have attempted the same for even bituminous material properties also. So, this is a study by uh, Zapata and Houston and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was published as an uh, NCHRP report, right. And uh, this, this report tried to validate the ACM model for granular layers. You can see here uh, in this, um, in, in, the, in the whole map you can see they have indicated three different uh, types of sites. One is sites which are to be visited and compared to historic data sites to become uh, compared to historic data and then the sites which are visited, right. So, the, this is a, a map which indicates locations which were chosen and then you can see uh, they had categorized the locations based on the uh, different conditions. So, one is mean average air temperature. So, locations which have mean average air temperature as less than uh, greater than 15 degrees and for locations which have it as less than 15 degrees, okay. So, this location itself they have categorized into locations with high precipitation which is greater than 800 mm and low precipitation less than 800 mm. Similarly, for temperatures with lower uh, temperature conditions also, they have the same two sets of data depending upon the precipitation level. Then, uh, in each of these locations, uh, they might be subjected to freeze and thaw effect or they might not experience the uh, sub-zero temperature at all. So, again they are classified into frozen and no freeze condition, okay. And in a given condition, the coarse grained soil, in fine grained soil, high plasticity index and low plasticity index. So, these were the different kind of locations for which they had collected data. And if you look at pavement type, they looked at hot mix asphalt concrete pavements, they also looked at PCC pavements, okay. And for these conditions, what is the groundwater table depth? So, a deep groundwater table or a shallow groundwater table, okay. So, this is how they categorized pavement into different categories and then they listed how many pavements was visited in each of this category for data collection. So, you can see here, for example, one pavement which has uh, which is a hot mix asphalt, deep water table, coarse grained soil, no freeze, high precipitation and high MAAT. 
So, like that they had collected data from different set of locations, right. So, based on this data they were able to uh, they were able to uh, compare the uh, parameters. And what are the parameters required to run EACM? So, to validate the model they had collected all these input parameters from each of the layer. We can see here they have information on uh, analysis conditions, the section state identification number. So, these are all uh, these are all uh, the, uh, the typical information that we collect for a location, pavement lane properties, type width etc environmental. So, once we know the latitude and longitude, we are able to pull in the climate database. So, that is why only latitude and longitude are specified. Similarly, the pavement structure, what is the layer number, what are the types, thickness etc. The moisture content and the dry unit weight and then unbound material gradation. So, what is the percentage of all these materials gradation and all and then what is the soil classification as per hashto and what are the Atterberg limits liquid and plasticity limit and the gradation parameters. So, the this much of information it is required to input in the EACM model when we are trying to calculate the uh, calculate the uh, required parameters. Now, we can see we said we are going to predict the moisture content right at any given depth and for a, any given instant of time. So, they had done two kinds of analysis, one is to collect the moisture content data directly from the field at different depth and the second one is to use the EACM model and predict the moisture content data. So, this is the uh, correlation that they observed between the measured moisture content and predicted moisture content, right. So, more or less the software was able to predict the actual moisture, con uh, moisture conditions in the field to a closer extent. Right. So, this is uh, one parameter which they have calibrated. Again, they have similar kind of illustrations for different types of soils, um, different uh, climatic conditions and so on. The next one is the uh, next one is the soil water characteristic curve which, which helps us to identify the uh, degree of saturation in the subgrade soil depending upon the suction capacity with respect to a given water table. So, we had seen a similar equation previously which was the uh, Gardner equation a very simplified form, but the actual equation used in MEPDG is by Feudland and Zinc. Okay. So, this is the model which they have used we can see here it is a function of which is nothing but this is volumetric moisture content theta w is nothing but the volumetric moisture content this depends on theta which is the saturation water content and constant c h this constant c h has h as the metric suction and all the other parameters are fitting parameters. So, this h is nothing but the metric suction here a f b f c f h epsilon all of them are fitting parameters or constants ok. So, that is why we were saying depending upon the condition say even in this case if they evaluated for a coarse grained soil and a fine grained soil given all the other conditions to be same these fitting parameters will vary. There might be some slight variation in these parameters. So, for another location with another soil type this parameter will vary. So, that is why it is necessary to calibrate these models whenever it is to be used for a specific location. So, this model and the fitting parameters were also calibrated and this SWCC was used to predict the moisture content. So, you can see this is the predicted degree of saturation and this is the measured degree of saturation. Again they had done it differently for non-plastic soil and plastic soil because I said right the fitting parameters will tend to differ. So, hence two different set of parameters were used for the two types of soil. So, we can see here the degree of saturation was also kind of predicted more closely using the ICM model. So, this uh, so, this is just a glimpse of how uh, the model fared for a given condition. So, this is given in this uh, study by uh, uh, study by Zapata and Houston. So, all the uh, all these data were from their study. You can look into the study for more details about the validation process, how it uh, the how the constants varied from one case to another, right. So, finally, to summarize about the EICM model. We, we come back now and look into the same table, the table that we saw in the first or the second slide, right. We have different data, we have rainfall data, material property data and temperature 
related information. So, we are going to use all of this information. We have two different kind of uh, temperature uh, and moisture profiles that we will be computing. We will compute the temperature information on the surface, right. So, we will, we will, we will, we will write it here. One is the moisture information, other one is the temperature information. So, this temperature information we will calculate at the surface. So, we have all the environmental parameters. We will use the CMS model, right. We will, we will use the heat balance equation. How much of radiation is received by the pavement? How much is reflected back? What is the influence of convection? What is the convection coefficient? We will use all of it and then we will compute the temperature at the surface, right. So, using the, uh, so this depends on the convection and radiation process, right. Similarly, the lower point we assume it to be a constant node, right. And using the finite element procedure, we will be calculating the variation along the depth, right. So, this is done for a given instant of time. And similarly, we can compute it for all other conditions. So, again for this, we will sublayer the pavement take a value at the mid depth. Again, this value is going to follow a, this value is going to follow a distribution, divide that into 5 quintiles and use the value of each quintile for damage computation, uh, each quintile for prediction of modulus and also for damage computation, right. So, this is with regard to the temperature information for the pavement. This temperature information um, uh, depends on the conductivity and heat capacity of the soil as well. So, this is with regard to pavement temperature. Similarly, if you look into the moisture effects, we have precipitation and infiltration drainage model. So, which will help us to calculate, let us ignore the bituminous layers here. Let us compute the moisture content at the surface of the first unbound layer, right. Also, so then from this moisture content, we will be able to predict the moisture content variation along the depth, right. Also, we will have a subgrade here. We have water table. So, from the water table, because of the capillary action, we will know what is H. Depending upon the variation in H, we will be able to calculate the water content at any given instant. So, uh, this water content is calculated and then we use it to predict the resilient modulus, right. So, this water content for calculation of water content and resilient modulus also is a layer. Similarly, depending upon moisture present here, we will compute the moisture at uh, every instant and from that also we will be able to compute the resilient modulus, right. Also, we have a frost and thaw model which will tell us what is the depth of frost and what is the depth of uh, thaw. So, uh, during frost what is the heave that is happening? I had uh, illustrated how heave happens during frosting with, an, with a pictorial representation in an earlier lecture. You can recall that. And uh, during thawing, how much is the depth to which this thaw effect is observed and what is the settlement of the pavement because of this thaw effect, right. So, this is in a nutshell the kind of output that we are interested in from the EICM model and we have understood the relevance of all these parameters and how it is going to influence the pavement design. So, finally, it is an integrated model that considers the effect of most environmental variables. This EICM encompasses precipitation, infiltration drainage, CMS model and CRREL model. So, we have inputs at level 1, level 2, or level 3, right. Again, I forgot to mention here we will have uh, this hydraulic conductivity, dry, I am sorry, saturated hydraulic conductivity, then we have dry thermal conductivity, and for both case and also 
heat capacity. So, we have all these things, right. So, um, these are the kind of input parameters we have to input. So, we can have a level 1 or level 2 or level 3 parameter depending upon the availability of data. So, you should recollect that level 1 is the most accurate one and level 3 is more approximate. And uh, for implementation of this EICF model or for translating it to any location of interest, we should be developing in-house calibration constants. The form of the model, some mo in most cases, the form of the model might be valid, but even, uh, even to, to be more precise, we have to even check whether the form of the model itself is valid. But for as a first step, we can still use the same model, re-evaluate the calibration constants and then, uh, and then use it for uh, use it for our location of interest, right. So, this is an overview uh, in, in, in a very, very, uh, very uh, brief manner regarding the ACM model. So, I thank you for your time. In the next lecture, I will be talking about the uh, different design procedures and how this climatic information is used in each of these design procedures. Thank you.